order, please. We will now begin the daily routine, presenting and reading of petitions, presenting reports of committees, tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In my capacity as uh, Justice Minister, I hereby beg leave to table the 2010 Annual Report for the Nova Scotia Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Review Office. The report is tabled. Statements by Ministers. The Honourable the Premier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise in my place today to inform this House that the province of Nova Scotia will be providing $100,000 in funding to the Red Cross for Japan's relief effort. Mr. Speaker, on March 11th, Japan was hit by one of the largest recorded earthquakes ever. It spawned a deadly tsunami, which slammed into the small island nation, leaving a huge swath of devastation in its path. Mr. Speaker, Thousands of people are dead, many more are missing or injured. Almost half a million people are homeless. The devastation has been described as the country's biggest crisis since the end of World War II. Mr. Speaker, the confirmed death toll exceeds 10,000 people. It will cost the country as much as 25 trillion yen, or between two and three hundred billion dollars to rebuild. Mr. Speaker, according to the World Bank, it will also take Japan up to five years to rebuild and recover from the damage that this earthquake and tsunami has inflicted on their country. Nova Scotians have been shocked and saddened by the magnitude of the crisis and, in particular, by the extensive damage experienced in many of Japan's fishing communities. Mr. Speaker, as a fishing province, Nova Scotia can only imagine how this would severely impact not just their industry, but their way of life. Mr. Speaker, we wish to express our deepest concern and sympathy to the people of Japan, particularly those who have lost family and friends and those who continue to suffer. Mr. Speaker, we would also like to offer comfort to our fellow Nova Scotians who have loved ones in Japan who have been impacted by these disasters. Nova Scotians recognize that major disasters require a huge amount of international support and a shared responsibility to help countries get back on their feet. Mr. Speaker, we are world-renowned for our generous and caring spirit, and this effort serves as no exception. Mr. Speaker, I commend the Japanese Society of Halifax along with individual Nova Scotians and companies who have raised funds to help the victims of this disaster. Thank you for your thoughtfulness and contributions. Mr. Speaker, we hope that the province's financial support will help make a difference to our friends in Japan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Premier for advanced copy of his speech today. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians watched with horror the devastation that struck Japan on March 11th. On behalf of the members of the Liberal Caucus, I extend our deepest sympathies and condolences to the people of Japan in the aftermath of this tragic natural disaster. The ties between J Japan and our province are strong. There is a connection of family and friends that span both of our borders. Halifax has been twinned with Hakodawi for nearly 30 years. Both are port cities. Both have a star-shaped citadel at, the, at their center, and both are similar in size. While Hakodawi is located north of the, the earthquake's epicenter, significant damage has occurred. The bonds of family and friendship will remain resilient as Japan goes through a period of both recovery and rebuilding. As was, as was mentioned earlier by the Premier, Nova Scotians are generous people. The Japanese Society of Halifax, as well as individual Nova Scotians and companies, have raised funds in support of this relief effort, and these efforts are making a difference. 
Mr. Speaker, it is only fitting that our government show leadership and join with them and offer our financial support as well. Mr. Speaker, our thoughts and prayers with the people of Japan, not only today, but into the future. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, too, want to thank the Premier for providing us with a copy of his statement in advance uh, and giving us, the members of the Progressive Conservative Caucus, an opportunity to lend our wholehearted support to the funding that the government is providing to the J Japanese relief effort. Like people all over the world, Nova Scotians felt helpless as they watched the devastating coverage of destroyed homes, crumbling infrastructure, and heartbreaking human suffering. We rejoiced at the miraculous rescues, and we wept for those who lost. Our hearts continue to go out to the thousands of Japanese who are searching for a loved one, caring for an injured relative or friend, or grieving the death of someone they loved. This humanitarian gesture that the government is making today on behalf of all Nova Scotians will hopefully ease the helplessness. So many here feel and will provide some comfort to the Japanese people who are struggling in the aftermath of the earthquake and the tsunami that swept through the island of Japan on March the 11th. As the Premier said, Nova Scotians live on and by the sea. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians know too well the truth in Herman Melvin's description of the sea in the classic Moby Dick. When beholding the tranquil beauty and brilliance of the ocean skin, one forgets the tiger heart that pants beneath it and would not willingly remember that this velvet paw but conceals a remorseless fang. We respect that awesome power and we want to help. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians are well known for their generosity of spirit and have a well-earned reputation for lending a hand to those in need. Today's announcement is in keeping with that concern that we all feel. And so I want to join with the Premier and all members of the House and all parties in thanking the Japanese Society of Halifax, the Nova Scotia companies and many individuals who have made donations and raised funds for the victims of Japan's disaster. These gestures make us all proud to be Nova Scotian. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to stand before you today to share information on how our Better Care Sooner plan is making a real difference for Nova Scotia families. Nothing, Mr. Speaker, is more important to Nova Scotians than health care. Almost two years ago, we put together a genuine plan for today's families in mind. Government knew and agreed with Nova Scotians that emergency departments were overcrowded. We agreed that patients were waiting too long to receive emergency care, and we planned to do something about it. This plan included a promise to open more hospital beds to admit patients stuck in emergency departments. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to say to the honourable members of the House of Assembly that we have done just that. Yeah. Six months ago, I stood in the Queen Elizabeth Health Science Centre and announced government's investment in new beds and a rapid assessment unit. On that September day, Mr. Speaker, I was optimistic about the tremendous potential of the new unit and our promise to help patients. Now, patients from across the province are diverted to a rapid assessment unit for faster access to specialist care. And today, Mr. Speaker, Capital Health is reporting that nearly 1,200 patients have benefited. These are people who have traveled by ambulance from communities as far away as Sydney and Yarmouth. While our highly trained paramedics do their very best to keep patients comfortable, 
The last thing people need is a long wait after such a long drive. Our investment in the rapid assessment unit was intended to reduce emergency department bottlenecks and provide Nova Scotians with better access to emergency care sooner. Mr. Speaker, I'm extremely pleased to share with the honourable members that this is exactly what is happening. Mr. Speaker, the additional medicine beds have helped decrease the bed wait time for admitted general medicine patients by more than an hour. As well, significantly fewer patients are experiencing the frustration, disappointment, and delay in care caused by cancelled surgeries. The number of cancelled surgeries has dropped by more than half as a result of the new beds. <laughs> On the advice of Dr. John Ross, we are improving patient flow. Sandra Janes, the Health Service Director for Emergency Medicine and Geriatrics at Capital Health, says that the rapid assessment unit has made a huge difference. Ms. Jane says that with the number of visits to the emergency department increasing, this unit helps move people more quickly. Her colleague and site chief, Dr. Sam Campbell, agrees with her. He says that the unit has been a great success and is the first step in solving overcrowding. Mr. Speaker, one of the government's most important commitments is to provide Nova Scotians with better health care. And our Better Care Sooner plan that we announced in December is based on standards that set and raise the bar on quality care. This plan delivers government's commitment to keep emergency rooms open and shorten wait times. And I'm especially pleased, Mr. Speaker, to stand here today before you and the honourable members of this House to say that Capital Health is helping us achieve this by providing Nova Scotians with more timely access to the emergency care they need. And Mr. Speaker, at this time, I would like to welcome our colleagues from Capital Health who have joined us in the House today. With your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I would like to introduce Dr. Sam Campbell, who is the site manager of the ER at the uh, Queen Elizabeth II Health Science Centre. <laughs> Sandra Janes, who is the Health Services Director. <laughs> and Sue Harris, who is the manager of the Queen Elizabeth II Emergency <laughs> Center. And Mr. Speaker, they represent a few of the many healthcare workers who are helping our government keep its commitment to providing Nova Scotians with better care sooner. They are all part of the team that is helping to get patients through the ER faster. And I thank them and I encourage them to continue their good work to reduce the times patients wait. Mr. Speaker, it's a pleasure to share the progress that we have made. But believe me, I understand, and this government understands, that there is still more work to do. And we will do this work, Mr. Speaker. We are doing this work, and we are committed to getting the job done. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's my pleasure to rise today and, and respond to the Minister's statement on behalf of the Liberal Caucus. And I would first like to thank the <coughs> Minister as well for uh, providing a copy of the statement yesterday, which is a great help to us. I'd uh, certainly like to, to uh, acknowledge that a there has been success at the ER at the Capital Health District, and I think that it's good to have an update 
that's what we, we uh, often have our ministerial statements taking us forward with new initiatives or, or the first announcement of something. Uh, today we are hearing back about an announcement that was made some months ago and, a, and really a progress report. So from that point of view, I think the House appreciates being kept up to date. And I certainly would like to acknowledge the hard work of Capital Health uh, and, the, and the district here at Capital Health District. The, the players, the, the executives, the, the site managers, um, Dr. Campbell, who had taken me as well on a tour of the facility as some, I guess about a year ago. Uh, I know they've worked very hard to try and improve the service to the patients that are coming in. And, and that is important because it is a tertiary care hospital and we're the center of, for, for many patients from around the province. But I wanted to say today as well that the rapid assessment unit was in place prior to, even, even during the past government, so two years ago. I think it's been expanded and I think the new medical beds may be helping to move people more quickly through. But we have had a rapid assessment unit in place, so I think it's a continuation and an expansion of something that was was begun and was a positive a positive move for the province so just to acknowledge that it was in place and that where you see something good you'll move forward with it and expand it as well um, again I, I think we need to acknowledge the hard efforts and and congratulate all of the players at Capital Health District for their initiative and planning and advice that they provide to the Department of Health uh, and while we're talking about the improvements there, we can't lose sight of, of other hospitals, even here in Metro, like the Dartmouth General, that continue to see some very uh, challenging times. There are patients that are admitted and discharged all through the emergency room, even after spending days in the hospital at, at Dartmouth General. And we are still hearing of the code orange calls indicating you know severe overcrowding at Dartmouth General so we want to you know mention as well that that has to somehow translate into the other major facilities here in the in the province uh, certainly anything that is going to decrease the suffering of people as they come into the emergency room I think is great and to hear that that it has helped uh, you know I think the minister said 1200 people they, they have counted have had had the opportunity to have faster service is very important and although the minister didn't mention it there is the opportunity as well for paramedics to to be on the road rather than stuck in emergency rooms so mr. speaker the main point we would like to say today is that there are many challenges elsewhere in the ER system and in the overall accessibility of doctors and we hope to hear more from the minister about that thank you thank you the honorable member for Argyle thank you very much mr. speaker uh, I want to thank the minister for providing a copy of her statement to our caucus uh, last evening I would also like to welcome the healthcare professionals from Capital Health who have taken time from their busy schedules uh, to join us here this morning the people uh, the work these people and thousands of their colleagues across the province do is vital and is very appreciated by the people they serve and by all of us here in this legislature. Mr. Speaker, there's no doubt that too often Nova Scotians wait too long in overcrowded emergency rooms. And any measure that reduces the frustration and fear that people experience while waiting for care is to be commended. And that's why I'm pleased to congratulate the minister this morning on her progress the government's investment has made at the QE2. Reducing the bottleneck at the emerg that emergency room is good news for Nova Scotians who need emergency services for the dedicated men and women who are also frustrated by the inability to provide service in a timely manner. But I do have to agree with the minister when she says there is more to do. Today, the minister told the House about a reduction in emergency wait times and admitting times at one hospital, Mr. Speaker, a large hospital, but Mr. Speaker, only one. Nova Scotians and many communities around the province are still faced with long wait times to be seen at their local ERs, or worse, they must deal with the chronic closures of their emergency rooms. And many of those people would not have access to uh, emergency rooms if they had a family doctor. And today's statement is cold comfort for the many people uh, who continue to wait too long for other procedures. The Canadian Institute for uh, Health Information or Kai High recently reported that less than 75% of hip replacements, knee replacements, cataract surgeries, and cancer radiation treatment patients receive uh, treatment within the benchmark, and they are not receiving better care sooner. The Institute said wait times are increasing for CT scans. These Nova Scotians are receiving good care later. Mr. Speaker, I point out that these statistics do not take away from the progress that the Minister is, is reporting at the QE2. But to illustrate how much work there is to do in our province, work that has direct impact on Nova Scotians. We are lucky to have the many talented healthcare professionals in our province. We just have to provide them with a sustainable healthcare system that serves them and serves all of Nova Scotia better. 
In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I again want to thank the minister for his statement today. No further statements by minister. Government notice of motion. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Premier has designated April as Daffodil Month in Nova Scotia in order to raise awareness of cancer in our province, and whereas the Canadian Cancer Society has recently unveiled a new daffodil pin to symbol a badge of courage in the fight against cancer, and whereas the Canadian Cancer Society has been very active for the past 75 years in their goal of eradicating cancer and improving the quality of life for Nova Scotians living with cancer, therefore be it resolved that members of the House of Assembly support the efforts of the Canadian Cancer Society by wearing the daffodil symbol to show that Nova Scotia is determined to beat this horrible disease and support those Nova Scotians and their families who are living with cancer. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. And with your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I draw the member's attention to um, staff and volunteers from the Canadian uh, Cancer Society, Nova Scotia Division, who are here in your gallery, Mr. Speaker, today. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> there has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those against? Motion is carried. The Honourable the Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotia had the opportunity to host the Canada Winter Games this year, and Team Nova Scotia were honoured to accept the Centennial Cup for being the team to demonstrate the most improvements since the last appearance at the Canada Winter Games. And whereas more than 5,000 Nova Scotians demonstrated a remarkable effort when they volunteered their time and energy to ensure that the Canada Winter Games would be a success for Nova Scotia. And whereas every event of the Games was well attended by Nova Scotians who were there to cheer for our team, for the many local musicians who performed at the Celebration Square, and for the young people from every other part of Canada. Therefore, be it resolved that the House of Assembly recognizes the outstanding efforts of the volunteers, athletes, and the people of Nova Scotia for contributing to, to, to make the 2011 Canada Winter Games a tremendous success. Mr. Speaker, I would request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Economic and Rural Development and Tourism. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, order, please. The Honourable Member has the floor. I hereby give notice that on a future day, I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Jason Downey of North Preston and Matt Whitford of Kempfel are two young African Nova Scotian boxers who represented Team Nova Scotia at the Canada Winter Games. And whereas Mr. Downey and Mr. Whitford both won gold medals in their respective weight classes in front of a packed house at the Halifax Forum during one of the most thrilling events of the Games. And whereas these young men are not only great athletes, but role models of hard work, courage, and determination who have been celebrated in their communities. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House join me in congratulating Jason Downey and Matt Whitford for their fine performances and wish them successes in their future endeavors in and out of the boxing ring. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? All those in favor say aye. aye. 
All those against, say nay. Motion is carried. We now recognize the Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall, one, read and table the message from Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor, transmitting the estimates of sums required for the service of the province for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2012, for the consideration of this House. Two, table the estimate books. Three, table the Crown Corporation business plans. Four, table the estimate and Crown Corporation business plans or resolutions. Five, deliver my budget speech. And six, move that the estimates of sums required for the service of the province like for the that. fiscal year ending March 31st, 2012, being supplied to be granted to Her Majesty and the Crown Corporation business plans be referred to the Committee of the Whole House on Supply. And Mr. Speaker, for the information of the House, the budget will be presented next Tuesday, April 5th. Thank you. Motion is tabled. <laughs> Introduction of bills. <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal. The bill is written on a napkin. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, I, if I may be permitted, can I have an introduction before I introduce this particular piece of legislation? Most certainly. Uh, in the gallery opposite, we are joined this morning with uh, five uh, wonderful people who have made a long time commitment to improving legislation in this province. Uh, and they are going to be joining me in the Red Room for a bill briefing here in a few moments. And I'd ask them to stand, if I could please, uh, Constable Sherry Curley from the RCMP. Sergeant Brian Herrick from the RCMP, Superintendent Don Spicer from HPD, Susan McCaskill, and Margaret Miller from MAD Canada. Thank you for being here. We welcome all our guests to the gallery and hope you have an enjoyable day watching our proceedings. Uh, the Honourable make... Minister of Transportation, Infrastructure Renewal, please. And if I may be permitted for further introduction, and I know she's not prepared for this, but in the gallery opposite is one of the people from Communication Nova Scotia who routinely makes me look good as a Minister of Transportation, Infrastructure Renewal, which means, of course, she walks on water. But more importantly, during the next nine months, she's going to have the opportunity to go on maternity leave. And I would like to acknowledge her good work and, of course, recognize the fact that we'll miss you during the next number of months. So if you could stand and recognize uh, Lindsay Lewis, please. From PIR. Thank you, Lindsay, and sorry to embarrass you, but I was going to do that ahead of time anyway. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would uh, like to take this opportunity to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 293 of the Revised Statutes of 1989, the Motor Vehicle Act. Thank you. <clears throat> the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal begs leave to introduce a bill entitled an act to amend Chapter 293 of the Revised Statute 1989, the Motor Vehicle Act. Bill number one, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 293 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Motor Vehicle Act. Order the bill be read at a second time on a future day. <clears throat> the Honourable Member from Dartmouth. East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to table a bill entitled an act to ensure the health and well-being of all Nova Scotians in the use of hydraulic fracturing. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East begs leave <coughs> to, to table a bill entitled an act to ensure the health and well-being of all Nova Scotians in the use of efficient hydraulic fracking. Bill number two, an act to ensure the health and well-being of all Nova Scotians in the use of efficient hydraulic fracturing. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. I'll order this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled, an act to modernize the government of Nova Scotia. Don't laugh yet. <laughs> the
the Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Modernize the Government of Nova Scotia. Bill number three, An Act to Modernize the Government of Nova Scotia. Order the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Review the Provincial Tax Regime. The Leader of the Official Opposition begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Review the Provincial Tax Regime. Bill number four, an act to review the provincial tax regime. Order the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled an act to require balanced budgets, limit government spending, and reduce the harmonized sales tax to 13%. The Honourable Member for Inverness begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Require Balanced Budgets, Limit Government Spending and Reduce the Harmonized Sales Tax to 13 per cent. Bill number five, an act to require balanced budgets, limit government spending and reduce the harmonized sales tax to 13 per cent. Order the bill be read a second time on a future date. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill on behalf of the member for Kings West. And the uh, title of the bill is An Act to Amend Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2010, the Finance Act, Respecting District Health Authorities. The Honourable Member from Halifax, Clayton Park, begs leave to introduce a bill an act to amend chapter two of the acts of 2010, the Finance Act, respecting district health authorities. Bill number six, an act to amend chapter two of the acts of 2010, the Finance Act, respecting district health authorities. Order the bill be read a second time on a future day. Notices of motion. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Clayton Park. Mr. Speaker, uh, just a minute. Have you got the, the operative clauses here? Mr. Speaker, I beg to, to I hereby give notice. Mr. Speaker, I beg to I hereby give notice. It's been a while since we've been here, Mr. Speaker. I don't have, the, I didn't have the intro on this piece of paper. Oh, isn't that 16th session? And anyway. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the month of April marks Canadian Cancer Society's Cancer Awareness Month, and whereas volunteers across the province will sell daffodils and participate in a door-to-door -door residential campaign to raise funds for research, public education, and patient services, and whereas while there is progress being made in the area of cancer prevention and treatment, there is still work to be done. Therefore, be it resolved that members of the Legislature recognize the month of April as Cancer Awareness Month and extend our appreciation to the Canadian Cancer Society and its dedicated volunteers who together are working to overcome cancer and create healthier lives for all Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, I, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. Thank you. Thank you very there has much. been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favour say aye. All those against? Motion is carried. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas on March 2nd, 240 sailors and a Sea King helicopter detachment on board HMCS Charlottetown left Halifax Harbour to take part in Operation Mobile, Canada's response to the situation in Libya. And whereas the brave men and women of HMCS Charlottetown will be away from their loved ones for up to six months on this deployment. 
And whereas the Canadian Forces have a well-earned reputation of making a difference in difficult situations, and all Nova Scotians are proud that HMCS Charlottetown is once again answering that call. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly salute Commander Craig Sherpin and the crew of HMCS Charlottetown for their bravery and wish them a safe return to Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? Motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. And I bring forward this notice of motion on behalf of the MLA for Picto Centre. Whereas recently local fiddler Fleur Mainville was presented with a piece of history, and whereas the Overseas War Veterans Association presented Fleur with a fiddle believed to have been made during the Second World War, and has been in possession of several members within the association over the years. And whereas the fiddle contains years of history and is only passed on to those who the association feels should be honored. Therefore, be it resolved that members of this House of Assembly not only congratulate Fleur Mainville on her recent recognition, but congratulate the Overseas War Association for making sure such a fantastic piece of history remains in the local area and in Canada. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Reading Recovery is a research and evidence-based program designed to assist grade one students in learning to read, and whereas since 1995, Reading Recovery has helped 23,000 struggling young readers achieve success in Nova Scotia's public school system, and whereas Reading Recovery has been identified as the best short-term early intervention program in North America, ranking first in a field of 153 programs recently assessed, therefore be it resolved that the Minister of Education acknowledge that cancelling the Reading Recovery program was a mistake and continue to provide the opportunity for grade one students in our public school system to benefit by participating in Reading Recovery. The motion is tabled. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas a Cape Breton teen with the compassion and the drive to help others has volunteered for World Vision by raising awareness and funds to fight poverty issues in Africa, and whereas Anna Fricker of Groves Point started volunteering with World Vision at the age of 16 when she organized a local 30-hour famine and traveled to Tanzania as a World Vision Youth Volunteer, and whereas Anna was recently selected as one of Canada's top five teen philanthropists. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly show how proud we are of Anna by congratulating her on being selected as one of Canada's top five teen philanthropists, and thank her for her amazing heartfelt work she has done and continues to do. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? Motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Guysboro Sheet Harbour. Mr. Speaker, I beg uh, leave to make an introduction. Oh, certainly. Uh, in the East Gallery today, we have the Mayor of Council, Frank Fraser. Uh, Mayor Fraser was here yesterday with us uh, at the opening of the legislature and uh, I want to acknowledge his uh, attendance yesterday as well as his attendance in the house today. So if you join me in welcoming Mayor Fraser. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker. 
I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Mrs. Glenda Redden, a resident of Chester Basin, received the Crystal Tourism Award of Excellence for Golden Hospitality, and whereas Mrs. Redden works at the Lunenburg Visitor Information Center and was the driving force behind the 250th anniversary celebration of Chester Basin, and whereas the Crystal Tourism Award of Excellence is given to people with pride in their service and who go above and beyond to enrich visitor experience. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of this House of Assembly extends congratulations to Mrs. Glinda Ridden on being awarded the Crystal Tourism Award of Excellence for Golden Hospitality. And thanks for her for all her hard work and dedication that she gives to visitors, her community, and the province of Nova Scotia. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? The motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the 2011 Canada Winter Games were held in Halifax from February 11th to 27th, and whereas J.P. DeVoe is chair of the 2011 Halifax Canada Games Board of Directors and Host Society, and whereas the Winter Games was a successful and positive event that brought excitement and spirit to the core of Atlantic Canada, uniting Nova Scotians and celebrating our province on the national stage, therefore be it resolved that members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating JP and the 2011 Can Canada Games Board of Directors on their successful event and thank JP for his dedication and to the growth and spirit of Nova Scotia through his many volunteer endeavours. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? The motion is carried. I now recognize the honourable member for Argyle. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future date I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Canadian Cancer Society recognizes April as Daffodil Month for its campaign to raise money for life-saving cancer research, public awareness programs, and community services. And whereas the daffodils are the first flower of spring and chosen by the society because of the bright, cheerful flowers create an atmosphere that radiates hope and faith that cancer can be beaten. And whereas each day more Nova Scotians are impacted by the disease and we need to work together to overcome cancer and create healthier lives for all. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly honour those so many who have been impacted by cancer and recognize April as Daffodil Month. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passes without debate. Thank you. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Southside resident Patricia Nickerson has been chosen by her peers as a representative volunteer for the town of Clarks Harbour for 2011, and whereas Patricia Nickerson has spent almost a lifetime volunteering in our community, proving to be a valuable asset for more causes and organizations over the years. And whereas Patricia Nickerson, who was nominated by Branch 148 of the Royal Canadian Legion, is described as a volunteer among volunteers who is credited for her achievements and the community. Therefore, be it resolved that this House of Assembly congratulates Southside resident Patricia Nickerson for being chosen by her peers as a represented volunteer for the town of Clarks Harbour for 2011. Mr. Speaker, request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? Motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Abby Murin is a student at Caledonia Junior High School in Dartmouth, and whereas Abby competed as part of the artistic gymnastics team uh, Nova Scotia in the Halifax 2011 Canada Winter Games in February, competing in many events, including team event female, 
and whereas Abby represented Team Nova Scotia in her hometown of Dartmouth with pride and enthusiasm, bringing positive energy to the games and exhibiting good sportsmanship, therefore be it resolved that members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating Abby on her achievements at the 2011 Canada Winter Games and wish her every future success. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? Motion is carried. I will now recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Frank Sutherland of Richmond County passed away this morning after a seven-year battle with cancer, surrounded by his loving family, and whereas Frank was a past District Vice President of the Progressive Conservative Party, a former candidate, former Constituency Association President, recipient of the Progressive Conservative Party's President Award, and a dedicated grassroots volunteer who gave countless hours to the party and to the province of Nova Scotia. And whereas Frank, active with the Bonnie Bray Seniors Club in St. Peter's, was also a music lover who founded the Stone Mountain Music Festival and enjoyed celebrations with a Cayley. Therefore, be it resolved, that all members of this House of Assembly remember Frank Sutherland's <coughs> lifetimes of volunteerism and public service and send our deepest sympathies to his daughters, family, and many friends of the, at this very sad time. Mr. Speaker, I would request a moment of silence, waiver of notice, and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? Motion is carried. Thank you. We'll now recognize the Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Upper Sackville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas 15 members of the Hammonds Plains, Upper Sackville community, community participated in the 2011 Canada Winter Games in Halifax this February, and whereas these athletes represented their communities as members of the Nova Scotia Women's Hockey, Synchronized Swimming, Ringette, artistic gymnastics, short, short track speed skating, and freestyle skiing teams, and whereas each and every athlete and staff member trained diligently to be able to participate in the games, and their hard work has made them great role models to other young athletes and members of their communities. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the House of Assembly congratulate the 15 members of the Hammonds Plains Upper Sackville community who participated in the 2011 Canada Games in Halifax and wish them best of luck in their future competitions. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Bedford, Birch Cove. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Be Bedford Hammonds Plains District is a fast growing area where the design for a new high school to replace Charles P. Allen High School is underway, and whereas this government is not planning the new school with enough space for its increasing population, which by Halifax Regional School Board's own numbers will see 1,326 students attending a school built for 1,200 on opening day in September 2013 and 1,554 students by September 2018. And whereas this failure could see labs repurposed as classrooms, which would leave students unable to use the labs for experiments, a situation which already exists at the much smaller C.P. Allen building, therefore be it resolved that the members of this House of Assembly urge Halifax Regional School Board 
to adjust its proposed school size request to reflect the size of the population it will serve and urge the NDP government to protect lab, lab space. I hereby request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? I hear several no's. The motion is tabled. The Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the federal and provincial governments recently recognized 2011 as the year of the entrepreneur, in recognition of the role small and medium-sized businesses will play in securing the nation and the province's ongoing economic recovery. And whereas 97% of businesses in Nova Scotia are considered to be small or medium, and all of them succeed because of the entrepreneurial spirit of the people who own and operate them. And whereas Nova Scotia's innovative and resilient entrepreneurs make important contributions to our province's economy and will continue to play an essential role as Nova Scotia recovers from the recent economic downturn, therefore be it resolved that all members of this House salute the ingenuity and resourcefulness of our entrepreneurs during 2011, the year of the entrepreneur in Nova Scotia and Canada. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against, the motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Kings North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Annapolis Valley District Health Authority works to improve the health of individuals, families and community, and has a broad range of programs designed to benefit its employees, and whereas Medicor Incorporated identifies organizations from across the region that show leadership in progressive workplaces and forward-thinking human resources policies, and whereas Medicor Incorporated has identified the Annapolis Valley District Health Authority as one of Atlantic Canada's top employers, therefore be it resolved that the Nova Scotia House of Assembly congratulates the Annapolis Valley District Health Authority for being named one of Atlantic Canada's top employers and wishes the DHA every success in its efforts to raise the profile of the Annapolis Valley as a great place to live and work. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? The motion is carried. <laughs> now recognize the honourable member for Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I Thank you. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Or as the Yarmouth New England Ferry is an essential part of Nova Scotia's transportation infrastructure and serves as a vital economic link between the province and Canada's greatest trading partner and international friend, or as the leader of the official opposition committed in Yarmouth on March 22nd to ensure a Liberal-led provincial government would provide the necessary investment to ensure restoration and long-term operations of a viable Yarmouth New England Ferry service. And whereas the member for Queen's on behalf of the NDP government issued a press release stating that she was pleased, and I quote, that Mr. McNeil is supporting her NDP government's position on the Yarmouth to Maine Ferry, be it resolved that this government follow through on this commitment to allocate the necessary funding to ensure restoration and long-term operations of the Yarmouth New England Ferry. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. Agreed. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. I hear several no's. The motion is tabled. I will now recognize the Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Victoria Co-op Fisheries, based out of Neal's Harbour, recently took part in a trade mission to Las Vegas, Nevada, and whereas the cooperative of Neal's Harbour catches and also markets and processes lobster and crab, and was the only Nova Scotia business taking part in the trade mission to Las Vegas in February, and whereas the Victoria Co-op Fisheries was established 56 years ago in 1955 and presently has 150 boats fishing out of seven harbours while employing 160 people. Therefore be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly applaud Osborne Burke and his team at Victoria Co-op Fisheries for their dynamic business and wish them continued success with their export business to the United States. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. Thank you. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? 
All those in favor say aye. aye. All those against? Motion is carried. I will now recognize the honourable member for Glace Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Bayplex in Glace Bay and all rinks across Cape Breton hosted 124 hockey teams, their families and large crowds of enthusiastic hockey fans during the renowned Vince Ryan Memorial Adult Hockey Tournament last weekend. And whereas the thousands of male and female athletes who visited Glace Bay and other host communities enjoyed the hockey, culture, and warm hospitality that we offer time and time again. And whereas the success of the Vinci provides lasting benefits for our future generations as the proceeds of this tournament go directly to a scholarship fund for Glace Bay High School and all high schools in Cape Breton. And I did cover the cost of the ambulance myself, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Therefore, be it resolved that the House of Assembly joins me in congratulating tournament organizer Rich Warren, the Vinci Board of Directors, the 250 volunteers, and the people of Glace Bay who made the 22nd annual event a smashing success. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? All those in favor say aye. All those against? The motion is carried. We now I recognize the honorable member for Argyle. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future date I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Tri-County Women's Centre in Yarmouth celebrated 100th anniversary of International Women's Day on March 10th and a banquet held in the Lions Club in Yarmouth. And whereas this year's International Women's Day theme song is Strong Women, Strong, or theme is Strong Women, Strong World, which brings to light the leadership roles women play as leaders, caregivers, and educators on a local, provincial, and international level. And whereas the honorees this year, Doris Laundrie, Dr. Sheila Leahy, Edith Tufts, Elaine Smith, Ada Fells, Marilyn Francis, and Joan Semple come from many different backgrounds and cultures, but their combined contributions have made our community a better place for women and their families. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly join me in congratulating the Tri or this year's Tri-County Women's Centre honorees on their many achievements and contributions, and thank the Tri-County Women's Centre for highlighting these empowering women. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? Agreed. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Cape Breton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Celtic Gospel Male Chorus of Cape Breton celebrated its 60th anniversary, on March 27th with a concert at the United Protestant Church in Sydney River. And whereas the chorus began in 1951 at the Trinity United Church in Whitney Pier. Yes, Mr. Speaker, in Whitney Pier. With only 10 members. And whereas the Celtic Gospel Male Choir is thought to be the group with the greatest longevity of its kind on Cape Breton Island and has endured because of its love of gospel music, fellowship, and the rewards that comes from giving to others. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House of Assembly congratulate the members of the Celtic Gospel Male Chorus on their 60th anniversary and wish them many more years of worship through song. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those against? The motion is carried. Orders of the day will now recognize the Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do now request that uh, the House return to the reply in uh, address, uh, address in reply to the speech from the throne. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now recognize the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I want to just go back uh, to yesterday for a moment, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and recognize the fact that Her Honor was here along with Chief Justice McDonald and yourself, who was sitting in the chair, chair all of whom represent the community of Whitney Pier, and what a pride, proud 
a day it must have been not only for your families but for the entire community of Whitney Pier. Uh, and indeed, how pleased we are that we were here to witness that. It's, uh, there's nothing quite like uh, getting an opportunity to see a community to be able to celebrate its own and be able to recognize its own. And uh, congratulations to you uh, for being part of that uh, yesterday. <laughs> Having said all that, I was a bit surprised to find out that the member from Glace Bay actually hurt himself in the pier. <laughs> Got the ambulance on the pier. The, am the ambulance picked him up in the pier. He, 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 He's trying he, out the system. He, yeah, that's right. He, he, know, he knows now where the border to his riding is. <laughs> I also want to recognize uh, the chief clerk, who this is his first session in his new position, uh, here, here. and uh, thank him for the dedication and the service that he's provided to our province in the past, and I know that he will into the future. So congratulations on your new appointment and all the best of success. And all. <laughs> And I also want to recognize the deputy clerk who is here, and this is her first session, and she spent some time with us in the last session, but this is her first session as, uh, in her new role, uh, and we want to wish her all the best, and don't be afraid if I start yelling behind you on the odd occasion. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, yesterday, I, uh, as, as going into the last election campaign and we were reviewing, and it's interesting is in this House, traditionally it's been the case that a government after a general election will lay out a vision of where it wants to go in a throne speech and, and then implement that uh, vision over the, the next number of years between then and the next general election. In this case, so we're doing something new. We're, we're laying out a throne speech with no vision every year. Uh, Going the last election campaign, we talked. One of the hottest topics was emergency room uh, closures across this province, Mr. Speaker. And the NDP during that campaign had committed to keeping emergency rooms open 24-7 uh, from one end of Nova Scotia to the other. And communities uh, across this province believed them, uh, were working with them. I believe it was all parties that acknowledged and recognized that would be the goal. And what we've seen in, in, this, in the throne speech yesterday, they talked about uh, keeping emergency rooms open, Mr. Speaker, what they've actually done is change the names of the emergency rooms that they're actually going to reduce hours in. It was interesting as I followed in Dr. Ro John Ross's report and his solution for uh, emergency rooms around this province really focused an awful lot on access to primary health care. He, he actually moved away from talking an awful lot about emergency rooms and what he talked about was the access point for Nova Scotians. And he says, if, if you follow and read the report, what he is actually saying is the Nova Scotians do not have access to primary health care in the venue that is required, whether it's in a clinic, whether it is in a doctor's office, uh, whether it is in a dietitian's office, whether it is visiting their pharmacist to get a full sense of what the uh, uh, medication review, looking at uh, what the medication is going to do. And what he was looking for was really a, a long-term view about how we're going to uh, fix the access point uh, into a primary health care. Uh, and what this government has done is actually reduce the hours of service in outpatients or emergency rooms, whatever you want to call them across this province, which means Nova Scotians actually have a, a less of a chance of entering into the health care system to receive that primary health care. We had laid out a, what we thought were some reasonable ideas on how we could do that. Mr. Speaker, we believe, and I still believe it's a good idea, that we would dedicate 20 medical seats at Dalhousie Medical School, that the province of Nova Scotia would fund uh, the tuition for those medical students who are prepared to work in underserviced areas across this province. We had committed to a five-year program, Mr. Speaker. That would uh, allow 100 family physicians to be distributed across this province, to be out there to allow Nova Scotians to uh, have access to primary health care where and when they need it. But Mr. Speaker, as you probably just recently heard, uh, 20 of those uh, uh, students have been returned to, uh, to New Brunswick. We, be we believe, and I believe most Nova Scotians believe, it was a wonderful opportunity for this government to show leadership, to go out and dedicate those seats to those uh, medical students who would sign a contract with us and work in underserviced areas across this province. But instead, they were extremely disappointed to hear that not only were we not doing that, 
that Dow Medical School was selling those seats to Saudi Arabia. Now think about that for a second. We have a chronic shortage of family physicians across this province. And what we're doing today is we're going to educate doctors for Saudi Arabia. How is that making health care more accessible for Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker? It simply is not. It would have been a reasonable approach that we would have dedicated those seats so that Nova Scotians would have had access to a family physician. Instead, what do we do? We invest millions of dollars in a paving plan to compete against the private sector. Makes absolutely no sense. Government has a responsibility, Mr. Speaker, to deliver the services that Nova Scotians want, quality health care, quality education, looking after those most vulnerable in our community. It is not the responsibility to compete against the private sector. It's to take our precious, hard-earned tax dollars and direct them in a way that will deliver the services that Nova Scotians want and deserve. Mr. Speaker, we've also laid out to this House that we believe that there's a wonderful program that will go a long way to reducing costs in the health care system, and that is by funding insulin pumps. Mr. Speaker, not only would that provide a better quality of life for those Nova Scotians suffering from diabetes, but it has been proven that it will all, would also reduce the long-term health costs in this province. I know, Mr. Speaker, that is looking beyond today. Both of those ideas would be looking beyond today to find solutions to the challenges facing our province, but that's what governments need to do. Mr. Speaker, recently in the throne speech in New Brunswick, the government of New Brunswick, with all of its challenges, recognized the value of funding insulin pumps and went ahead and did it. Good for the people of New Brunswick. Good for that government to recognize the value in funding insulin pumps and recognizing the long-term value and reduction to the health care costs in that province. And we as a province need to begin to look long-term. There was a lot of phrases yesterday, health care sooner, better, all, but when you go actually go out and talk to communities and engage them, no one feels that access to health care is better today than it was 18 months ago. As a matter of fact, many communities are very concerned because of what may happen, what may transpire. But Mr. Speaker, we need to reassure Nova Scotians that we have a long-term plan on how we're going to deal with the access to primary health care and I would encourage the Minister of Health and this government to adopt the idea of dedicating those medical seats to ensure that uh, we can distribute uh, family physicians across this province to allow Nova Scotians to have the proper access point into the health care system. <laughs> Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, it was mentioned that Nova Scotia has had the worst uh, economic growth in the last 21, 20 years. It has also had the worst economic growth in the last 21 months, Mr. Speaker. The NDP talk about this hypothetical number, a $1.4 billion deficit, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Order, order, please, order. The honourable member has the floor, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, thank you. Order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Order, Speaker. please, order, please. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The NDP like to talk about a hypothetical number of $1.4 billion deficit. Mr. Speaker, this is a real number. They've added $1.7 billion to the debt of our province. The, HS, the, the HST has increased. The HST... Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. He has the floor. He has the floor. The, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition has the floor, please. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, and I thought, and I thought we'd gotten along so well yesterday. And I thought we'd gotten along so well yesterday, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the real number is $1.7 billion that the Minister of Finance has added to the debt of this province, and he's on the verge of adding millions of more next Tuesday, Mr. Speaker. 2% increase in the HST, Mr. Speaker. 1,400 user fees across this province going up, downloading 
millions of dollars on the municipalities, Mr. Speaker, that are going to end up on the tax roll, on, on the residential tax bills of every Nova Scotian across this province, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Order, please. Order, please. The honourable member has the floor. It's the last time that I'm going to say this this morning. Thank you. The official leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's why we were voting for you 18 months ago to be uh, Speaker of the House. But, Mr. Speaker, those are real numbers. Those aren't mine. Those come from the Minister of Finance's own department about the numbers that I've laid out in front of you. There are real challenges facing our province. And, Mr. Speaker, the only economic tool that this government seems to have is the Industrial Expansion Fund. Mr. Speaker, they've spent millions of dollars millions of dollars to uh, distribute across this province with no business plans, not laying out and justifying how they can sit around the cabinet table and distribute that kind of money. And Mr. Speaker, at this point, we see no real benefit to the job growth in this province. Mr. Speaker, there's been a tremendous amount of money spent in Pictou County. And yes, I can tell you Pictou County deserves economic development, like Yarmouth, and every point in between from here to Sydney. But, Mr. Speaker, as they've been spending that money, the unemployment rate is going up in that community. That should tell you that that policy is not working and has failed. We had laid out an idea where we believed, we believed aggressively reducing the small business tax in this province would be a positive thing for, the, for, for growing our economy. Because we would be investing in the men and women who have weathered tough economic times before, we would be able to distribute that economic stimulus from one end of Nova Scotia to the other in every community. And we would be investing in those Nova Scotians that would be staying here for the long haul. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, when a small business makes an investment in their company, they look across their table and they recognize very early on, very early on, that when they bring someone onto the payroll, they're not just bringing on an employee. They are bringing on a neighbor. They are bringing on someone in that community who could be potentially coaching their children, someone who they see at social events. And the very last thing they do, the very last thing they do would be to give them a pink slip. They would ask them and help th ask them to help them weather the tough economic times that our province is in and have been in before and will be in again, Mr. Speaker. But they ask them to help them weather that. And for that, employment will be there. Consistency within the community will be there. And Mr. Speaker, those are the people we should be reaching our hands out to and engaging in in terms of finding our way not, out of, not only through this tough economic time, but finding our way forward so that when this downturn is over, as it will over, the opportunities that will exist at the end of it, those men and women will be ready and prepared to take advantage of them, the opportunities to continue to grow their business and continue to the invest in Nova Scotia communities from one end to the other. It is <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we were, I was pleased yesterday in, in, to hear and talk of the venture capital pool that the Premier has been talking about, uh, and particularly talking about the one involving Atlantic Canada. Our concern, though, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that we are an uncompetitive community at this point. We have some of the highest taxes in all of the Atlantic region, Mr. Speaker. And our, you know, when I, when I think about that venture capital being available in Atlantic Canada, unless we tackle the fact that we are not competitive, and let's be honest about that, until we begin to tackle the idea that we are not competitive as an economy, what we're actually doing is putting a pool of capital together for our neighboring provinces. Those that have made some tough decisions, those that have begun to move towards making sure that their economy was competitive, that their tax system was competitive, and that they would be able to then try to grow their economy. While we support the idea of a venture capital fund, Mr. Speaker, it is imperative that we as a province take a comprehensive tax review and look at where we can adjust our tax system so that we can create economic opportunity and jobs. It is so important, 
It is so important that we reach out across and give the signals that we understand what the business community is facing and that we are prepared to be their partner. Mr. Speaker, they talked in the throne speech about growing the economy and growing the private sector. Well, we fully support the growth in the private sector, Mr. Speaker. But what we're seeing when you see and you see a government make a decision to go into the paving business, Mr. Speaker, to compete against the private sector, the two things don't add up. They're conflicting messages and it is sending the wrong signal across this province. Mr. Speaker, the idea that government can deliver the paving in this province cheaper than the private sector is simply not true, and the department staff acknowledges it's not true. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that decision does one thing. It discourages the private sector from investing. It discourages the private sector from being optimistic about the future. And Mr. Speaker, it discourages the private sector from growing our economy. If we are going to find our way out of the tech, tough economic challenges, if we ever want to get off the bottom of the economic growth chart in this country, it will be through the private sector who will be able to deliver those services cheaper to Nova Scotians, more effective and more cost effectively, Mr. Speaker. So I would encourage this government, while it has gone down the road of buying a chip seal plant, that it stops at that point and does an honest assessment of the real value of that plant before it spends millions and millions of more dollars on a paving plant to compete against the existing ones already in this province. We had high hopes when the Minister of Transportation laid out a five-year road construction plan. Mr. Speaker, we supported that. It was long overdue. Industry was calling for it. It, it made sense. But what we had hoped that signaled was that government was going to then begin to look at how it tenders projects across this province. We would begin to see 70 or 80 percent of the road work for this year already out being tendered. So private sector then could compete, begin to look at what their work would be over the 12-month period, look about where they would then, how they could best deliver the best price. But instead, and these aren't my numbers, Mr. Speaker, these are coming from the own department. They are either behind schedule or at the same pace they were in years past at letting tenders. Mr. Speaker, that's not a way to get competition. That's not a way to get the best price for the people of this province. Lay the work out and let the private sector then go and compete for it, Mr. Speaker. Under the ideas and rules of this government, and one of the reasons why they say they're going to compete in the road business against the private sector is because they say there's been some tenders that have been too high. Well, you have a mandate to say no. If you believe you're being gouged by someone, say no and retender and ask other companies to compete. That's what government should be doing, not going out and spending money, foolishly chasing the idea that you can compete with the private sector. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, even if you believe the argument of government on this issue, and I think this is what really highlights the, 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 the flaw in the argument and what, why I think private sector is nervous across this province. Their argument was at the beginning was because we were going to compete because we thought we were being gouged in some areas. Well, Mr. Speaker, they're not competing. They're not competing. What they're going to do is take half of the chip seal projects and they're going to do them in-house. They're not going to be tendered. They're not going to allow anyone to view them. They're not going to be assessed. They're going to be done in-house. And then what they're going to do is they're going to put the other 300 kilometers out in the flawed tendered system that they accuse to be flawed. How is that going to give you the best price, Mr. Speaker? All that is going to do is build a bureaucracy and cost taxpayers money, called cost taxpayers more money year after year from one end of this province to the other, Mr. Speaker. We went down this road decades ago. It was, it was flawed then, and it is flawed now, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to hear yesterday their talk there was going to be a re-emphasis on tourism in southwestern Nova Scotia. We were going to make it a destination. Well, Mr. Speaker, my suggestion to this government, if they want to make southwestern Nova Scotia a destination, work hard to reconnect an international link to ensure that, no, that, the, that the, our tourists 
from the, down in the eastern seaboard have access into our province, Mr. Speaker. I've had the opportunity. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to be in southwestern Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, in Yarmouth. As many of you know, I represent the riding of Annapolis. And as I travel to this province, I've understood, understood the impact that, that, the, that the ferry service had in our communities. I must tell you, I did not appreciate fully, I did not appreciate fully the impact that was happening in Yarmouth until I spent some time there a few weeks ago. Mr. Speaker, regardless of where you go, regardless of who you talk to, there's one issue, the minds of the people of Yarmouth, and that is when are we going to have our boat back? When are we going to show some leadership as a province to sit down, bring the partners together, make sure that we do not lose another tourism season, make sure that we do not force more small business operators to make that tough choice, and that is to sell, close up, or move away. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there's an opportunity we see, as a, and I think most Nova Scotians will see in the issue of shale gas that's been talked about an awful lot, and I know the member from Dartmouth East has spoken on this uh, a number of times, and, and we see this as an opportunity uh, to grow our economy potentially. Uh, as was mentioned earlier today in the issue around fracking, which is, which is a, uh, a way that is used to, to, basically, Mr. Speaker, it pumps pressure and fluid into the ground and forces that gas out and allows us to capture it. There's been major concerns raised about that, uh, and we believe, and I believe most reasonable Nova Scotians would believe, that we should be going and proceeding very cautiously and making sure that we've laid out some regulations around the idea of fracking before we start opening up our border to our natural resource. Mr. Speaker, that resource is going nowhere. We want to make sure that when we do go and have it extracted, that we are doing so that it's in the best interest of Nova Scotians and not putting at risk our environment or the water table in this province, Mr. Speaker. We believe we can do that. We believe we can be leaders in that. But we want this government, before they issue any permits for fracking in Nova Scotia, that they've laid out very clearly some guidelines and regulations around that issue, Mr. Speaker, so that when people come into this province to invest, to work here, to go, to go in and extract our resource, they know very clearly from the beginning what is expected to them by us, Mr. Speaker, as a province. Mr. Speaker, it is part of the energy mix, and it can be part of growing our economy. Very pleased yesterday to hear that we're moving forward on the Lower Churchill Falls. Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to hear the Prime Minister to be here to commit yesterday to loan guarantees. Those are positive initiatives that, that will allow the private sector in this province to continue to go down that road. As all of us know in this House, was a mayor who struck a deal with the, the energy, with now core of, New, of Newfoundland to make sure that that link comes into our province. It is now, and I've said this before, our responsibility to continue to work together to see this project come off the blueprint. Yesterday's announcement by the federal government, and I'm sure, and I would, uh, well, I have no doubt, that the Premier had been talking and working through his federal counterparts to ensure that they understood how important this project was for our province, and that he was there and, and, and gave our case. But I think it's important that each of us, as we travel this province, make that case in our own communities. All too often it is looked at this project is one being made between large energy corporations who are doing very well. Well, I believe it is also there to get to us to a point where we'll get stable energy pricing, not cheap energy. Let's be honest about that. It'll get to a point where we have stable energy, but equally as important, it will be building the infrastructure that will allow us as a province to begin, to begin and build a renewable energy sector which will set us off, Mr. Speaker, for decades to come. Yesterday in this host, and I want to reiterate it again, we also are prepared and willing to support the work that the Premier is doing, that the government is doing, and I believe that all Nova Scotians want to see happen, and that is making sure that the National Shipbuilding 
project procurement ends up coming back here to the Irving Shipyard here in Halifax. Mr. Speaker, that is a positive project, not only for the shipyard of Halifax, but it is a, pro pro uh, it is a positive project for the entire province of Nova Scotia from one end of it to another. And any time that we can cooperate and work together to ensure that our national government understands the, where we fit in the Federation and the importance of Nova Scotia in ensuring uh, that we can deliver the contracts they're looking for, then we as a group of elected officials have a collective responsibility to work together and we will make that commitment to the Premier again here today in this House. Mr. Speaker, yesterday we had talked, uh, there was talk in this uh, throne speech uh, regarding how do we, how we help those Nova Scotians living in poverty, how do we help those Nova Scotians who need our support go forward. Some initiatives that were there which we were encouraged by, which was allowing uh, families to stay on income assistance uh, as they go through uh, the university, as their children go through post-secondary education is a positive thing. Mr. Speaker, as well as I believe we need to make sure that we allow uh, those Nova Scotians who have fallen on hard times and are relying on income assistance uh, to support their families, we need to find a better way uh, to make sure that we provide them with the quality uh, skills they will need to move off of income assistance into the workforce. And we also need to look at the idea of the clawback system, making sure that uh, we, are, we are encouraging them and helping them go find work that in the end, we don't strip back dollar for dollar, making, in, in make, taking away the incentive. Uh, I, it's my hope that as uh, we see some uh, issues rolled out in terms of how we have a, a dealing with our poverty strategy, it will be those kind of initiatives that recognize uh, when people want help, when people want to move forward, people want to work, that government is there to be able to help them do that as opposed to what has been for too long and it, it, being in the way, uh, penalizing them financially, or quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, not helping them get the skills that are required to go forward uh, to do what, what I believe uh, many and all Nova Scotians want to do, which, li which is live and work in a productive way uh, to do provide the best they can for themselves and their families and be involved in their community uh, at every at every facet, not only from uh, the work side, but also from uh, dealing with uh, the the many positive things that happen uh, from the community organizations to reaching out and helping. So we would be encouraged uh, as a caucus to help the government move forward on some of those initiatives. One thing that is concerning to us, though, Mr. Speaker, I think the most powerful tool that a government uh, can give its citizens is a quality education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, we have some real challenges in the public education system. Uh, regardless of where your child fits on the education spectrum, people aren't happy. Mr. Speaker, people are concerned. Uh, it doesn't matter where. I've made this statement before. I believe in a fully support inclusion. It's my belief the model we're using isn't working. We need to look at it. We need to ask ourselves, how can we do this better? How can we provide a better educational opportunity for those students, as well as ensuring that we have the supports there to, to provide and give every student an opportunity to reach their maximum potential. Mr. Speaker, when I, when I look at that, I, I, we've been debating for too long the issue of reading recovery. It, and it, it, it has surprised me, quite frankly, that debate has gone on as long as it has. Uh, it, was, it was my belief that it was a decision made in haste uh, without looking at uh, the, the evidence that supports the positive effect this program is having on students from one end of Nova Scotia to the other. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I had a wonderful opportunity to be on the South Shore to a public meeting and heard uh, so many positive stories about uh, families and uh, who parents were standing up talking about without reading recovery, they're not sure where their child would be today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I felt like I could tell them where their child would be and that would be struggling their way through the remainder of their public education. What this program, wa what this program did was provide a lease, a new lease on life for those students. It was wonderful to hear this lady talk about her daughter 
talked about how she, she could not get her daughter to go to school. Her daughter was sick, stomach was bothering her. It didn't matter what happened. And then she was able to enroll her in the reading recovery program, Mr. Speaker, and look out. This young lady's confidence soared. Her ability in, in the classroom took off. Mr. Speaker, her classroom teacher said, what a difference. What a contribution she was making today to the entire classroom education because of this program of reading recovery. It's an intensive one-on-one -on -one in intervention, Mr. Speaker, one that has been tested across this continent and other places, one that always comes out on top. Do we think there are challenges still in the system on how we deal with literacy for some Nova Scotians? Absolutely. But what we want and what Nova Scotians want is reading recovery to be reinstated to allow boards across this province to implement reading recovery and then do the add-ons that will be required to help those Nova Scotians who still need help later on. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, the one thing we should be doing and looking at and everything as a government we should do should be based on good evidence and making sure the outcomes are what we want. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I would challenge government to go into the Department of Education and find one other program that has been evaluated, been looked at more often than reading recovery, and I would challenge them to find any program that is delivering better outcomes than reading recovery. We should not be cutting it. What we should be doing is enhancing programs around it to ensure that Nova Scotians in grade one and beyond are reaching the, their basic level of uh, understanding of reading and allowing them then to soar through the public education system. Imagine the benefit to us for every child that we give a new lease on life, a new lease on life by look, teaching them how to read in grade one. Imagine the benefit to us in the long run as a province. But on the flip side, for every child that we fail, the cost to the public system goes on for a long time, Mr. Speaker. So again, I would say to you and say to uh, the members of, of the, the government, and particularly the Minister of Education, how important reading recovery is, how important it has been, and how important we believe it can be to ensuring that young Nova Scotians are getting the kind of education they need and the opportunities they need to grow, mature, and flourish into the young people who we know they can be. Mr. Speaker, after having an opportunity uh, to look at the speech last night, as I started off earlier, I, I talked about historically in this House what would happen is a government would get elected, it would lay out a vision in a throne speech, and then it would attempt to implement that vision over a three or four year period and then Nova Scotians would pass judgment on it. Instead, Mr. Speaker, what we have had here in less, in, in less than two years, three throne speeches, Mr. Speaker, what we've had is a party that had a vision to get elected, Mr. Speaker, but no vision to govern. And Mr. Speaker, because of that lack of vision, Nova Scotians are paying every day dearly for a government that has been more focused on being elected than governing. We know there are tough challenges facing this province. What Nova Scotians hoped for on June 9th was some leadership and change. Mr. Speaker, what they have here is a government caught in the headlights and no, not knowing where to turn. Mr. Speaker, on one hand, they say we're going to fix the emergency room issue and access to primary health care, well, the fix is closing them. They say, we're going to grow, they say we're going to grow the private sector, and then on the other hand, we're going to compete against it. And the list goes on throughout, Mr. Speaker, throughout this throne speech and the previous two of contradiction con after contradiction. Mr. Speaker, it's not too late. It's not too late for this government to accept the mandate Nova Scotians gave them and focus on govern, governing 
and stop focus on trying to be reelected. Mr. Speaker, with those few words, I'll take my seat. I will now recognize the Honourable Leader of the Progressive Conservative Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, members of the Legislature, uh, special guests, ladies and gentlemen, this is my first address and reply to a speech from the throne. And so I would like to uh, begin for a moment by again thanking the constituents of Cumberland South who have sent me here. I know, like many members know, perhaps all members know, that no matter what we do in our political life, that the greatest honour that we will ever have is to have been selected by the voters to represent them here in this chamber, despite all that happens, all the ups and downs, the good and the bad in political life. Knowing that there is a group of constituents that have sent you here to be their voice, to raise their concerns and their issues, to fight for them, it is a great honour, and so it is with them in mind that I rise today. It is with them in mind that I come to work, ready to support good policy when I see it, and ready to oppose bad policy also when I see it. And I would like to start, Mr. Speaker, uh, by congratulating you, sir, on your uh, election as our speaker, and to thank the member for Picto West, who was your predecessor, for the service that he has provided to this House. Uh, I certainly uh, look forward to working with you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I know the members of the Progressive Conservative Caucus look forward to uh, working with you to make the uh, level of debate and the quality of the decisions made by this House as high as we can possibly make them. just want to say a brief word to the member for Kings North and the member for Truro Bible Hill for their remarks yesterday and moving and seconding the speech from the throne. Uh, it's not often that I hear Nelson Mandela quoted in this chamber, but uh, it was uh, nice to hear, and I'll say that uh, particularly to the member for uh, Truro Bible Hill. And, Mr. Speaker, I would like to express my thanks and congratulations to the leader of the official opposition for the remarks that he just made. I can't help but note, sir, that he was subjected to a verbal barrage by the Minister of Finance at one point in his remarks. And so I wasn't going to do this, but uh, in support of his uh, uh, speech, I would like to table a document. I have with me, sir, the budget highlights document for the fiscal year 2010-2011. I'm hopeful that the Minister of Finance will recognize it when I table it. It was received at the Legislative Library on April 6, 2010, which must be on or about the date of his last budget. It includes a table of the net direct debt of the province of Nova Scotia. What's interesting about this document, Mr. Speaker, is that it says that the net direct debt as of the end of 2009, immediately before that bunch took office, was 12324 billion dollars. Mr. Speaker, it forecasts that for the end of this year, which actually was yesterday, that the net direct debt would be $14.002 billion, a difference in growth of $1.678 billion, making it true to say that they've increased the debt since they took office by $1.7 billion, as the Leader of the Official Opposition stated in their own documents, and I will table that, and I would encourage all Ministers of the Crown, starting with the Minister of Finance, to read it when they get a chance, before they engage in needless and inaccurate heckling of the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, for all of this in this House, while we may disagree from time to time, I think it is important that that disagreement be contained within our own borders. My father is from Pictou County, and he taught me a long time ago that although Stellarton may fight with Trenton, that, thank you for the applause, I hope I have a few more of those from the member from Pictou East. <laughs> he taught me a long time ago that although Stellarton may fight with Trenton 
and vice versa. That once you go over Mount Tom, you are all from Pictou County. And I agree with that. And that is why I know that we can all agree from all sides of this House to be in support of the government working with the Irving Shipyard as they pursue a very, very important contract under the National Shipbuilding Procurement Strategy. And the same is true of the Lower Churchill deal, which the Prime Minister of Canada saw fit to support last night. And so, as the leader of the provincial Progressive Conservative Party, I was very proud when leaving our provincial borders to go to Ottawa a month ago to be able to speak to the Prime Minister and the relevant ministers about both of those initiatives. And I want to assure all Nova Scotians that they may see us disagree from time to time in our province, that we are as one on those two agreements, which are of important and massive interest to our province when we are outside our borders. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the men and women of our armed forces, in particular those serving on the HMCS Charlottetown and the crew of the Aurora aircraft based at 14 Wing Greenwood, who will be away for their families on an extended trip backing up the Canadian campaign to protect the citizens of Libya. As well as we look around the world at the unfolding tragedy that is uh, ongoing in Japan, it reminds us, Mr. Speaker, that in Nova Scotia our problems are very small indeed. And yet we do have problems. There is an old saying. I don't know who said it. I'm hoping maybe the member from Truro Bible Hill or some other member will find me the source. Uh, there is an old saying that I have uh, believed in strongly uh, since I was a child. And that old saying is that our fathers were fishermen and farmers so that we may be business people and politicians so that our children can be poets and musicians. Well, my great-grandfather, Henry Bailey, farmed in Salt Springs in Pictou County. His son and my namesake, James H. Bailey, was a local grocer and business person and mayor of the town of Pictou. His son, my father, was the first Bailey to graduate from university. And here is where my story gets interesting. When my dad went to work, his business person father advised him to get a government job. The pay wasn't great, but you would be secure. You would have a good pension. That was the view of government in the 1960s. Now time went on, and when I graduated, at a time of government cutbacks, my own father advised me to go into business, which I did, first as a chartered accountant, and then eventually as CEO running our credit union. I left that job just last fall to go into politics, running for the leadership of my party and as an MLA. Someday soon, it will be my turn to advise my own children about their career choices. Like all parents, like all people in this house, I want them to soar as high as their talents and their ambitions will take them. In short, I want them to choose their own version of poetry and music. The reason I am here and the reason I believe all of us are here is because I am worried about what I will tell them. The one constant in all of the advice for the Bailey generations is that it was assumed that you could do whatever you wanted, wherever you wanted, here at home in Nova Scotia. It was assumed that the next generation would be a little better off than the previous generation. This has been, until now, a constant truth. But now, we are not so sure. I suppose any party could introduce its own 14 strategies, five studies, and three committees to address the issues that are facing Nova Scotia today. But after two years, that would be a cruel April Fool's joke. Unfortunately for Nova Scotians, as I think of the throne speech, it's apparent that April Fool's came one day early here in the House of Assembly in Halifax this year. A government that promised change 
looks more and more like the same old, same old every day. April Fools. Saying you want change is not the same as actually changing things. April Fools. Launching dozens of studies and schemes doesn't mean you have actually achieved anything. April Fools. For a province facing real population decline, promising an immigration study in three consecutive throne speeches is no longer funny. For a province that is so reliant on a vibrant forestry sector, promising a new natural resources strategy over and over, throwing the industry into turmoil and uncertainty is no longer funny. For a province that is recovering from recession, raising the HST by a record amount and then boasting of a new economic strategy is no longer funny. The speech from the throne unfortunately demonstrates how little progress we have actually made in areas like living within our means, creating a competitive tax environment and attracting investment over the last two years. These critical elements to creating a growing economy are what will keep our children here. Now, Mr. Speaker, in fairness to the NDP, they came to power during a period of global recession. But saddled with a promise to balance the budget that year, they could have been honest with Nova Scotians about the dilemma they faced, but they didn't do that. Instead, they played the same old game of blaming their woes on predecessor governments. But, Mr. Speaker, this tactic contained an inconvenient truth for them. According to the Auditor General of Nova Scotia, they hadn't, in fact, inherited a mess from their predecessors. They inherited eight consecutive audited surpluses and balanced budgets. This is the word of the Auditor General of Nova Scotia. Faced with this inconvenient truth, they chose to concoct a structural deficit, a fiction that they had to slay. They engaged Deloitte's, and the Deloitte report is very clear about the goofy assumptions that that bunch made Deloitte's follow to concoct this fiction. Now, many Nova Scotians went along with this in the hopes that the government would actually rein in spending, bring finances to a better place. But instead, government spending has gone on unabated. It is up 9 percent over the past two years, and we have record taxes and fees instead. Now, that report from Deloitte's cost the government around $100,000. But the true cost to taxpayers has been hundreds of millions of dollars more in extra HST and other taxes and fees. April Fools. So, Mr. Speaker, after two years of a majority government, there is little to brag about in this chamber. We were presented with a throne speech with no proof of progress on the deficit, on ER closures, or jobs. In fact, it seems that the goalposts that they set for themselves are constantly shifting. The government has boasted of coming in under budget on spending, but they themselves set those budget targets. And so it is not right to brag about beating your own soft targets. It is an old trick, Mr. Speaker. The question, Mr. Speaker, is when? When will they get on with achieving real results? In the throne speech yesterday, they again, for the third time, talked about their plan to keep ERs open. Now, as has been pointed out by others on this side of the House, we no longer call them ERs, we call them something else. But just today, Mr. Speaker, in the real world, I got notice from All Saints Hospital in Spring Hill listing the hours that their ER will be closed. And we still wait for real action and real results, and not just new names for the same old problems. We know that rehash studies and plans in reality 
won't create a single job, keep an emergency room open, or lower people's taxes. And I worry. I worry, Mr. Speaker, that Nova Scotia is actually in worse shape today than when the NDP took over, because the real numbers don't tell a good story about where Nova Scotia has gone under this government. There are some obvious indicators. We have the highest sales tax in the country. We have among the highest income tax in the country. Thanks to their breaking of their agreement, municipalities will likely soon have among the highest property taxes in the country. And we do have among the lowest rates of economic growth in the country. And all of those statistics, Mr. Speaker, are related. We also have a per capita debt, a per person debt, that is the second highest in Canada. And it is growing. $1.7 billion as tabled, as stated, in the last two years. It is growing and will continue to grow as long as the NDP stick to their slack plan to someday, somehow, at some future date, actually, truly reduce and eliminate their budget deficit. Next year's projected deficit, we hear from the Minister of Finance, will be $370 million. Their deficit in 2009, when they took office, was $329 million. That is not progress, Mr. Speaker. Those are facts. Those are the numbers. The government preaches one thing, but program spending continues to go up. We are clearly headed in the wrong direction. After all, it is only through truly balanced budgets that we'll make any progress on reducing our province's $14 billion debt. I mentioned we have a per person debt that is the second highest in Canada. In fact, it is closing in on $14,000 per man, woman, and child in this province. And I put special emphasis on child because it is our children that will inherit that debt. It is they who will bear that burden. And we know that we have fewer and fewer young people who are here to carry that weight. Mr. Speaker, you know it is expensive to carry that much debt. We're already spending 10 percent of our revenue on meeting our debt payments. Imagine if your income was $50,000 a year and you had to spend 5000 of it just on interest every single year. I can tell you. I saw that every day at the credit union. It is a sad, sad state for a person to find themselves in. It has a significant impact on their quality of life as it begins to decline. It hurts their ability to provide for their family or save for their future. And deep down, people know that for government, a debt that size is just another measure of deferred tax. New graduates leaving our education system know this to be true, that that debt will eventually show up in higher taxes and fewer services. They are already weighing that into their decisions about where they will build their own future. And too few of them are choosing to stay in our province, and too many of them are choosing to move away. That is why, when a government chooses to run a deficit, when it chooses to run three deficit, deficits in a row, as we know the NDP will do during this term in office, that is why we know when they do that, that the talk about keeping our young people here at home, the talk about bringing new people to our shores, the talk about creating new jobs from prosperity is nothing more than just talk. Perhaps we should do a strategy on talk, Mr. Speaker, because the choices they make, the lazy, lackadaisical the way they go about balancing our books, the choices that they make show the opposite. The throne speech yesterday, with all of its plans, strategies, committees and studies, show us that the NDP is actually putting off for tomorrow what they should know we need to do today. And the result of that delay that someday someone will have to pay. 
But Mr. Speaker, we've been here before. And I would like to point out some differences between the NDP government's approach to financial management today and the approach of 10 years ago, the last time this province found itself with a significant deficit and needing to balance the books. In 1999, after six years of Liberal government, program spending in Nova Scotia was just over $5 billion a year. And there was significant pressure from the NDP then to increase it. But there was also an inherited deficit, a true one, an audited one, according to the Auditor General, of $497 million on $5 billion of spending. In other words, a true deficit that was over 10% of the provincial budget. By contrast, the projected deficit for the upcoming year of $370 million is just about 3% of the total provincial budget a much lower hurdle for the government to clear. In 1999, that deficit was dealt with by controlling spending. In fact, the records will show that in 1999, program spending grew by only 0.3% over the year before. In 2000, it grew by 3.6%. And in 2001, it grew by 1.9%. All of those numbers are within the constraints of, our, of inflation of the day and population growth. And by the end of the third year, the budget was balanced. And I might point out, Mr. Speaker, that it was balanced at the old rate of HST, at 13%, without recourse to digging deeper into people's pockets, as this bunch has done. And we might wonder why that is, Mr. Speaker. Why are we seeing this now, almost two years into their term, and after two budgets and one more to come next week, that there is still no progress on the deficit, even though the HST has been increased by that much? And the answer is that program spending is up by 9% over the last two years, Mr. Speaker. This at a time when there was virtually no inflation and the population has been flat. Not surprisingly, with that level of extra spending, We've made no progress on the deficit, but we have the honor of paying 2% more in HST uh, for that privilege. On top of that, the government has taken steps to just shuffle the cards around, Mr. Speaker. Last week, we learned that they broke an agreement with the municipalities to shift $50 million of cost onto their shoulders. Not only breaking agreement, but ensuring that our property taxes will go up by a similar amount. And I might add, Mr. Speaker, with regards to the HST, now the highest in the country, God help us if the Liberal Party is ever elected to the government of Canada. Because we know with the support of the federal NDP that the national HST will be going back up to the higher rate, from 5 to 7. And we won't be sitting here at 15 percent. We'll be sitting here paying 17 percent in Nova Scotia. And we'll see what that does to our economy then. So, Mr. Speaker, did the government have to do this? Did the government have to do this? Was the budget so tight that they had no choice but to raise taxes? Well, let's look at the evidence. In 2004, the total provincial budget was close to $6 billion. Here we are seven years later, after seven years of minority government and progressive conservative government, it's only fair to add, and the budget is $9 billion, a 50% increase. Nova Scotians can ask themselves if they feel 50% better served by their government today than they did in 2004. Or another example, in 2004, the employment of the government of Nova Scotia, the departments of government, not counting our teachers and nurses and doctors that are working in schools and hospitals, just the core of government itself, in 2004, employed 9,000 people. Today, the government employs 11,000 people, a 20% increase. Our population is the same but we have 20% greater number of public servants working for the government than we did just seven short years ago. 
One more indicator, Mr. Speaker. In 2004, provincial government spending accounted for 21 percent of our province's economy, our GDP. Today, that amount is 30 percent. At a time when all businesses and households are required to find ways to tighten their belts to become more efficient, the government is, in effect, becoming much less efficient. If there is anyone who doubts that the NDP could, could have achieved a balanced budget this year, consider this. Right next door in New Brunswick, they have a deficit that's almost three times the size of ours, a real deficit. Their newly elected premier wasn't in his job for more than two weeks when he ordered civil servants there to find 2% cost savings in their departments, and he gave them two weeks to do it. 